Well, I guess we're live now. <laughs> yes. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, uh, Gohar, Kalina, and Georgia. Thank you hello. very much for joining this conversation series at Women's Fund Armenia. We are very glad that you managed to, you know, find some time in your schedule and, you know, dedicate, the, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes to discuss with us and with our audiences. Uh, what are you doing? What are your what are your objectives as a fund? I'm just going to um, quickly uh, remind to all uh, our followers that we're having guests from Reconstruction Women's Fund, uh, and uh, Galina and Georgia will soon introduce themselves too. Uh, but for those of uh, for those who are joining the first time. Uh, conversation series. This is the, the regular conversations and live sessions that we're having with Gohar from Women's Fund Armenia. And we are very glad that we kind of um, managed to make it to, you know, first year. We already passed the first year of our conversations and more than 30 conversations and live sessions and interviews with many different people in, in, and also in between ourselves. I'll just switch to Armenian for a second just to introduce everything in Armenian too. Vorchun Meng Bolorin, I saw Inchpestes Numek, Gohari Het, Hure Runeng, Yev, Inchpestes Numek, Galinan, Yev Georgian, Miatselen Mes, Nank, Vera Karutsum, Kanans in Adramitsen, Vogetum Serbeum. Եվ մենք շատ ուրախ ենք, որ կարող ենք նաև ներկայացնել այս տարբեր երկների և հատկապես այս տարածաշրջանի հիմնադրամներին։ Okay, I'm, I'm coming back to English again. <laughs> yes, um, so... Uh, well, we are planning to discuss many things about your organization and also the fund, uh, the Re Reconstruction Fund. Well, we um, maybe know um, a couple of things about, you know, the fund, but um, maybe you can first, uh, you know, introduce yourselves, just a quick round, and uh, then we will go to discuss uh, what is doing, what the, what, what the Reconstruction Fund is doing. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gohar and Sirana, for inviting us to talk about um, the Reconstruction Women's Fund. I'm the coordinator of the fund, Jurja Trajkovic, and I joined the fund uh, last year. So it's been a year that I'm, I've been here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Galina Maksimovic, and uh, I am uh, the program and community coordinator. And I have joined uh, in uh, October 2019. And uh, thank you really, really much for hosting us. Thank you for actually joining because I know you're also busy and I also know that it's summer. You know, it's kind of people are getting into this mood of uh, <laughs> uh, summer and, and uh, holidays, etc. But I'm, I'm really glad that we are here today and we can discuss what you are doing uh, in your organization and how maybe our journeys, journeys and, and uh, work are similar or different. That will be amazing. Um, can I say a few yes, words go on, John, about sure, the please. Fund? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm very, very glad to see you, uh, even though online for now. But I just want to say that it was my first trip to the Reconstruction Fund when I met the European chapter of Prospera in 2018. I think it was in 2018. And it's uh, very symbolic for me as well, because it was really like when we um, presented also a Women's Fund Armenia and then the Prospera chapter decided that we can become a member. It was very touching and that I have great memories about the fund. And, I just want to say also thank you for, for supporting us uh, emotionally and in any other possible way during the war that we have been through. And uh, because, you know, you have been through that as a country, as a fund. And so it was really very important for us to feel your support during these days. Thank you so much for thank being you. there for us and for showing this feminist solidarity. It, it always, it will always uh, be in our you know, thoughts and hearts, these this gestures mm -hmm. that you did. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, 
And I think, um, yeah, I think, and that that was it was uh, during some of the conversations as well when we were having in you know in the in um, you know in the scope of Prospera meetings as well, and it was during also the last year, and I, I and I also. Uh, I think it was Galina that was present there and I remember how you were writing that <laughs> everything will be okay and please let me know if, yeah. if you need to talk or something that is really that is really um, you know it's a maybe from from your side it's a minor kind of gesture but it's a huge thing when the when the person is is, is reading this so thank you so much for having you know this solidarity and also you know, support, kind of um, this virtual and also uh, support from, from afar. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and let's maybe dive into, the, uh, into your work and into your, um, you know, uh, activities as a fund, as the as a Reconstruction Women's Fund. Uh, please let, please give us, I don't know, a short um, understanding, maybe kind of brief understanding perhaps, or maybe long if you want, <laughs> uh, on what, what, is, what is the history, how it started, which, which topics are you covering, and yes, please. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words. It was um, it was a pleasure to being able to support you during the war because reconstruction women's funds kind of started as a as a consequence yeah. of the of the war conflicts in the nineties. Uh, in two thousand and four, it was um, started by activists from Women in Black, but also Open Society Foundation. So we've been acting for um, sixteen years now, and uh, we. Uh, politically support the feminist platform against war, nationalism, and militarism, and also racism, as we see those kind of three um, three levels of oppression to be the main causes of war. And um, in addition, of course, any kind of um, politics that um, goes against discrimination of women and women's human rights. Having said that, um, the fund uh, has been kind of supported in the last 15 years by the, what we would call the first generation of the post-war activists. And last year we kind of had a complete turnover of the, of the working team because the young generation took over and now we're kind of working closely with the managing board and maintaining the continuity. And I would say that, you know, one of the pillars of our work would be the continuity because often um, as it happens, not only in feminist movement, but in any kind of movement, there is a ongoing erasure of the work of the history and of the kind of the political work that has been done with women in the past. So we would say that, you know, our mission is supposed to support also any kind of work um, in, a, you know, either through projects or kind of uh, as a mission um, against the politicization and the heuristization of the feminist movement. Uh, having said that, in the past 15 or so years, we've uh, awarded over um, 800 grants. We work nationally, oh. mostly in Serbia, but we also support projects that work transnationally across borders. Uh, and we have uh, four lines of program as a general support that is a core support of the, of the groups, uh, formal or informal. We have special focus that focuses on projects that usually involves um, campaigns or uh, documentaries or uh, theater productions mm -hmm. or academic productions. By academic, I mean research productions into the topics that I just mentioned. And we also have re rapid response grants as the fourth pillar of our program. Um, as a fund, we also like to think of ourselves and we are perceived as being part of the feminist movement, which is rare, I think, uh, mm -hmm. but very uh, kind of works as our, um, it, it works with us as, as kind of a burden, but also a privilege burden because mm -hmm. we do have to kind of, because of the responsibility that we have as a fund to maintain and build infrastructure of the movement or maintain the infrastructure of the movement and a uh, privilege because we are also part of, you know, you're perceived not being outsiders, but insiders. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, I would say that what has happened in the last 15 years mm -hmm. with the fund has been kind of an extraordinary success, I would say. Um, and the fact that it has lasted this far and that it plans on lasting for many, many more years, ironically, 
uh, speaks to the you know previous generations that were part of the of the fund. So I would stop here. I don't know if Galina wants to add something. Just you know, we can go back to the Q and A for the for if, if people need more details. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Galina. Please, if you want um, to add. No, th this was us in a nutshell, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I have to continue with uh, the types of support that we provide or actually the groups that we support because it's right, uh, right. uh, core of our work. Um, we uh, typically support uh, grassroots organizations, uh, both formal and non-formal. Um, and uh, we are especially proud about uh, mm, supporting non-formal groups because it's not always the case with uh, foundations. And this is only one of our examples of trying to be really flexible and trying to be, uh, you know, um, less bureaucratic uh, than uh, perhaps other foundations. Um, we mainly support the uh, small organizations uh, that typically come from three uh, areas, uh, grassroots activism, uh, arts, and uh, academia, or the field of knowledge, uh, non-formal education, etc. Uh, what we are also very known for is uh, working with uh, self-representative groups. Uh, so it's not like um, giving uh, the group an agenda and uh, letting them just implement it. This is really something that we are opposing to, in fact. Uh, but we are trying to actually support those groups who know their communities, uh, know their um, know their needs, you know, and they are right. must be designed uh, autonomously what they are going to do and what they are going to promote and what pro problems they will solve. Um, we also um, support uh, groups that work with uh, diversely uh, marginalized or oppressed women, mainly women. Um, uh, all the groups that we are supporting are uh, women-led or women's full of women's groups and uh, very po politically articulated. This is uh, also of uh, vast importance to us uh, because uh, um, the movement uh, always need to stay uh, up to the game with their political articulation. And this is why we keep on saying that uh, politics matter. Depoliticization is something that um, harms the movement. Um, we award grants across the country um, with some regions being more represented and some regions actually lacking uh, feminist or women's or women led groups. So this is something that, I don't know, we perhaps should um, encourage to happen. Uh, we also support groups that are having a hard times finding uh, resources in uh, other uh, funders because of their uh, topics perhaps uh, that are unpopular, uh, especially when it comes to peace building groups, uh, you know, who keep reminding us on some unpleasant truths, you know, the mainstream, uh, doesn't want to fund that. Uh, so uh, that kind of bold, boldness is uh, something that is happening in this fund. Uh, when it comes to arts, uh, we uh, support politically engaged arts. When it comes to um, uh, academic work, uh, we um, support something that will contribute to the movement. Mm -hmm. And finally, we also um, uh, we support uh, stipendists. Um, young academics uh, for their master degrees and the uh, PhD uh, because feminist knowledge uh, and uh, knowledge made by women or for women is also being systemically erased. And right. what we're also known for is um, being really close allies to uh, women's Roma groups and uh, just supporting the uh, uh, Roma leadership, women Roma leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, as of uh, this year, uh, which has been tough, I mean, uh, 2020 was tough for all of us and we had to find uh, some new uh, lessons to learn. Um, I would say that uh, most of the groups that we uh, have been supporting uh, were actually uh, the groups that kept uh, working something that was supposed to be the duty of public institutions. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it reminded us of the importance of the group that we are supporting and um, their capabilities, their great resilience. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. and even going beyond their uh, typical activities just to you know provide some safety for their environments and communities wow Wow. beautiful amazing amazing (laughs) work really very impressive and it's in a way it resonates with us as as well because these are the main um, aspects of our work as well we do support scholarship feminist scholarship research but also activism and you know, like these topics that um, taboo in the society and you know, nobody, like mainstream donors for sure would not go for those topics. If I can ask a question, uh, see, is it okay? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I was when Georgia <laughs> mentioned that you see yourself as a part of the movement. We do, see, we, we see ourselves as well and we want to believe that we are part of the movement because <laughs> we came from the movement in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. Women Fund Armenia was uh, developed on the basis of very grassroots, quite popular organization, Women's Resource Center. So we smoothly transferred into the fund. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the positive and negative side of that and whether there is this, well, no matter what you do, there is still this power dynamic, I guess, in your case as well. We do feel that ourselves and we want to eliminate it as much as possible. but. Well, there are always some, you know, um, problems with that. But at the same time, uh, we, we, for example, we don't want to give up our position as a, a part of the movement. So it's really tricky mm. and challenging. I would like to ask you how you're managing that and how you're continuing your work. And if I may add, because I had almost the, almost the same question, because, yeah, when you were saying that, um, you are uh, kind of feel the privilege that you are part of the movement, and also it's sometimes it's um, you know it's it's at the same time it's a it's a privilege and also a big responsibility for you yeah. uh, when you are representing also the movement and also everyone in the movement. So is it kind of uh, what is what is hard and what is easy also in this sense? Yeah, so oh, thank you for the question. It's a good <laughs> one. Um, so, so power dynamic. So I, I don't think that the problem is that there is a power dynamic. The problem is that there is a certain kind of a power dynamic that as much as you undo it, um, you cannot overcome. And, and and I think that as long as you have money involved, you're going to have that, right? And yeah. this is the part that we are most uncomfortable with because at the end of the day, the decision-making process, the, you know, the... The, those who hold power, money hold power. I mean, this is this is this is the kind of societies we live in. So, in a sense, but I but but ironically, I think that um, this is not the biggest issue. I think that for us, what we have seen, and we are actually going through the process of evaluation of of the general support program, and what we have learned there is that at the same time that you have reconstruction seen as being the part of the movement it's stable and supportive because we do kind of and this i would say the responsibility and privilege comes from this sharing values and principles that we are very strict on in a sense you mm-hmm. know like anti-nationalism anti-militarism but at the same time transparency and autonomy as the pillars of the work yet on the sec on, on the other hand is that there is this desire from the activists in the movement for us to take a greater role as to kind of not only support, but create certain spaces. And I think that's the tricky part because there is a tension between creating a space and imposing the space. Um, And I think that this ties into the question of the global philanthropy, right? Philanthropy as such that we are living in where the money is circulating, where there is a criticism fair or unfair about the power dynamics. And then I think that the the part that is challenging for us is realizing that we constantly have to self-reflect and self-criticize when are we creating spaces and when we are imposing spaces or when we're imposing solutions or when we're trying to be, you know, uh, implementators. And Mm -hmm. the defense of the implementators, I think it's a very, um, it's a very slippery dynamic to be part of. So mm-hmm. I think it has to do a lot with language and attitudes that we use. So sometimes, you know, instead of saying do this, you suggest certain things because people, um, you know, because when you're an activist, you're in this kind of um, field a lot and in this context a lot. So you maybe don't see the other potentials or possibilities that, that might be there because you don't have time to reflect. Let's say that this is the 
this is what comes as a feedback. And I think for us is, you know, like really reflecting and understanding ourselves. When is it where we are creating spaces and when we are, you know, God forbid, impl you know, imposing something. And, and, and I think that when we hear feedback from activists, we want you to take a bigger role, you know, or like more solid law role. We are hesitant about that because we know the, the traps, right? We know that mm -hmm. it, it's slippery, that it's easy to, to get into that. Uh, but yet at the same time, there is a lure to do it because as any movement, there is a lot of internal dynamic intentions that are not working in, in our benefit, our meaning feminists, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's it, there isn't one answer to that question. I think it's very situa situational and contextual and, and that you have to take decisions as you go and consult as many people as, as you can in mm -hmm. order to make sure that you're doing um, maybe not the right thing, but not the kind of a thing that would harm the movement organizations or activists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I also have something to add. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> but quite briefly, the best thing uh, about being on both sides is trust. And the worst thing uh, for me particularly was uh, delivering the bad news. Your, your project is not selected. Uh, and how can I say it to my uh, allies, you know, yeah. from the field? Uh, right, but right. again, the solution is trust. I'm being open um, in conversation about that and also setting the boundaries, obviously, and switching roles from time to time, you know. Uh, by now, I think that I've learned how to, you know, just uh, uh, put on different hats mm -hmm. in different conversations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for this reflections and also, you know, uh, kind of opening up for opening up about your, um, uh, you know, about what you think about the situation as well. When, when about your situation when you are where where you are standing, I was also. Uh, it's just a question that just pop, popped up right you know when you were talking about the funding the groups as well. Uh, what what are the strategies that you are uh, using to actually fund or maybe find basically actually find uh, the groups that you are supporting find the initiatives and organizations are you are you giving like open calls or you are uh, directly approaching the groups that you are working with i think alina can answer this much better than i do yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's a mix of everything. Uh, one of the programs that we have uh, is uh, called General Support, and uh, this one is for handpicked groups. And the groups supported through this program are actually our long-term collaborators, and they are um, based on diverse criteria, uh, really important to the movement, and uh, they are handpicked. But when it comes to um, programs we do have open calls and we are experimenting with uh, where do we put them we advertise them on social media but we are also trying to you know um, use even those uh, generic websites with uh, all sorts of competitions going on in the country you know uh, just to give ourselves space to uh, be reached by some unexpected groups uh, we also, uh, you know, in our personal lives, when we meet certain people who are in activism and if they are haven't heard about reconstruction, uh, we mention uh, the programs that we are having. Um, we are basically, you know, uh, using every opportunity to present our programs and invite people to join. Uh, sometimes we do get also recommendations for certain groups and uh, then we give them introduction uh, how to apply. So open calls are yeah, available and uh, the reach to the groups is really diversified right now. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Wanted Thank to you. do a big tour and uh, meet some new groups that we haven't met before mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, but to, just to present our programs. But um, yeah, didn't happen. Yeah. For obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we were uh, uh, Georgia actually tackled this uh, 
very briefly in in uh, in uh, during during her, her um, answering the, the the one of the questions, and she was she mentioned also about the feminist philanthropy. Maybe we can go a bit on that too. You know, uh, just discuss what is what is feminist philanthropy for us, for you, uh, as a, as a women's fund, and um, basically how we are. Uh, how, as women's funds, you are actually practicing the, the feminist philanthropy? Because we talk about um, the uh, ideas in feminist philanthropy in our, during our conversations and also with our partners a lot. Um, yeah, so it will be very nice to hear for, from, from your perspective, too, about feminist philanthropy. Thanks. Um, I, I never understood feminist philanthropy, if there is such a thing. Um, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a question of identity, but the, the question of values and principles, right? Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. the way money is thought, used and distributed on one hand, and then it has to do with all the questions that are challenging when you have money revolving around issues um, that concern us. So in the sense that uh, if there is a relationship between money as being, as, as having a highly powerful whether positive or negative global value, we can argue about that, but what is it that happens around it? And I do think that feminist philanthropy is around that, around money. So in a sense that for me, it had to do with um, trust, autonomy and openness. Um, I don't necessarily like transparency because it, it is a very technical concept, but what I mean by openness is, is that, is, is precisely about having nothing to hide, knowing that it's impossible not to hide. Um, in a mm -hmm. sense that having kind of being open um, in spite of knowing that you're going to be exposed to um, aggression, violence, and attacks that mm -hmm. I don't know any place in the world where there, that, that is not the case right now. So that would be the question of openness. Autonomy basically has to do with trust, knowing and understanding that women who work in the field probably know much better than we do what is happening mm -hmm. and trusting them with, um, um, with decision-making processes and with activities that are happening in the field and how they're going to respond there. And then acting as a support and maybe as a thought or activity opener in that uh, situation. So I would say that those three are for me the, the mm -hmm. most important, trust, openness, and, um, and autonomy. I don't know if Galina has something to add, but I'm sure she can add to this. Uh, before Galina answers, I was just, it just um, resonates a lot. Um, uh, you know, there are many, many new partners that were working and we actually found out about them during the during our work during our activities and also meetings and trainings and um, you know uh, announcements of, of uh, support um, when when we started working as, as, a, as a women's fund uh, and there are many many women many many of our partners are saying that when when they real when when they read about it or maybe they hear about feminist philanthropy they also say that um, uh, they were kind of practicing all of this before but yeah it's it's kind of it's it's and it's uh, sort of a good thing to know that these values and these principles are already incorporated in one place and you can actually have some kind of an ident identity of or identity as well on on what you are doing i think this is really yeah, this is really interesting to, for, well, basically for us, it was really interesting to see that people are already practicing and they are getting into it and getting to know themselves, their work as well. Yeah. If I can just add before Galina starts. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to, me, to me, where feminist philanthropy has a, cha has a chance, um, if we understand feminist philanthropy to be something, um, even though not young, like theoretically younger, um, as far as articulating conceptualizing, I think the feminist philanthropy has a shot in a sense that it can intervene where the public perception of global philanthropy or what we understand today by, by philanthropy cannot. And mm -hmm. if, if you're looking at the public opinions and public images or, or the mood that it has towards philanthropy, there is a lot of hostility towards it, whether right. it whether it's um, kind of labeled from the right as foreign mercenaries or from the left 
as you know this should be tax money and not you know not power right, move to one right. person to decide how the money goes and i think that the families for and, and and both of those sides i would say that they they, they fail to understand something and that is that you work in a context that you're working in situations so that if you're going to change the way that money goes or flows it can become a um, valuable goal, but you don't have mm -hmm. the steps or strategies of how to do that. And mm -hmm. I think that's where from feminist philanthropy, like you said, because it practices a lot of the things that are happening in the movement, mm -hmm. and now switching mm -hmm. to the philanthropy, to the field for philanthropy, it can basically intervene where these two criticism um, cannot, or I, I'm failing to see how they can intervene, so. Right, thank you, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would like to add uh, a bit more about uh, local feminist philanthropy, because we know how to fund the grassroots movement, but uh, how to uh, fundraise uh, at the grassroots level. So feminist, local feminist philanthropy is uh, a good platform for that. And uh, so far, we have been developing it uh, mainly through public events. And uh, as those events uh, have shown, uh, this is a brilliant principle for bridging different kinds of people or even bridging movements, uh, bridging uh, organizations um, and uh, some wider community that will be engaged in their cause. And uh, what's also important is that um, such practices, uh, you know, encourage you to actually uh, think about uh, uh, other uh, issues related to money, where the public money goes or um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how the bigger money uh, flows are working, etc. You would be surprised how many people, you know, um, fail to um, recognize some of the greatest problems uh, regarding money. And what also mattered to us uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, our local philanthropy program is inclusive. <laughs> Uh, so we encourage people to, you know, donate uh, small amounts of money on a monthly basis or as they have a chance and resources. Um, we are trying to reach some new people and some new groups that were previously not engaged with our cause, uh, but probably uh, would be if they were mm, approached more directly. Mm -hmm. um, when I say uh, it matters to us that it's inclusive, I will give you an example. Uh, so we were uh, having uh, philanthropy parties uh, and where, where funding is, uh, fun should be also included. And um, we would typically make a deal uh, with the venue where the party is held. And uh, there would be our donation box, uh, which has its name and it's really a mascot of the fun. Uh, but even those who do not put uh, the money directly into the box, if they have a drink, they are already donating, you know, because right. a certain percentage of the price of the drink actually goes uh, to the cause that we are fundraising for. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were trying to make, you know, uh, uh, those kinds of uh, inclusive methods uh, to our local philanthropy. Uh, of course, in 2020, we did not have any events. Um, uh, we will continue with that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. We're now boosting our uh, online methods of uh, giving. Mm -hmm. And what we also consider important is education around local feminist philanthropy and why local resources matter and why such money uh, matters to the activists. It's not always just about the finances, but also about the gesture of support, uh, because the groups appreciate knowing uh, that there are people uh, who stand uh, um, right beside them and support their struggles. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was also thinking while you were speaking that it's also about changing the whole uh, perception about feminist philanthropy as well, because even, yeah, some people don't know at all, but there is also this wrong um, perception about whenever there is feminism and philanthropy or women and philanthropy is just your typical you know wealthy women supporting poor children etc I think also that it's the statement for us at least to show that what is feminist philanthropy and this is not maybe in, in centuries ago it was but now it, you can't just go with this you know um explanation and uh, because of that we also and to just to show the whole the great work that at least the um, European chapter but it Prospera in general does we decided to have the publication and I know you committed to send 
uh, some piece as well. So thank you so much. I think it will be really important to show this diversity of feminist philanthropy and so mm -hmm. forth to educate as well, you know, people around us to what mm -hmm. is it and why we call it feminist philanthropy and it just not and how it's in contrast with uh, your mainstream philanthropy or other type of philanthropies. And I think it will also um, be a good conversation to start talking about intersectionality in philanthropies as well. Um, I'm hoping to open up more conversations around that, uh, having this publication. Right. Um, yes, thank you very much for, uh, you know, um, being, uh, you know, actually joining this publication as well, because I think it's really important to, um, to have different perspectives on what is happening in, you know, in the situations that we are working in and it's in, in, in with, uh, uh, you know, in, in our, in our context, in different contexts. I'm a very big advocate for that, that we need to really talk about, mm -hmm. uh, talk about our different contexts very much, context very much. And, you know, it's very important to be vocal about different contexts as well. Um, uh, and what I was going to uh, ask you next, and actually, I think it, it's really linked, you know, um, I don't know how it happened, but uh, it's, it's actually linked with the, with the lecture that I was having two days ago with, uh, yeah, yeah, with, uh, with Serbian colleagues. Uh, yeah, and it was really uh, nice to hear about the, well, actually, it was nice to hear about that, of course, but also worrying that uh, there are some uh, legal changes as well that you are having currently, right? You are also undergoing there um, some changes also about the, the law on, on gender equality. Um, um, and maybe in, I don't know, you know I'm, I'm just taking the, the question in this vein, but maybe we can talk about the challenges of women's funds that are, that uh, you know, the challenges in general that the women's funds are facing in your opinion and also you as a, uh, as a separate fund, as a, as a reconstruction women's fund. What are the challenges that you are currently thinking about or you're facing? Um. Well, so when it comes to, well, I think that there are external and internal challenges. On the one hand, mm -hmm. when you talk about external challenges, um, there is also backlash happening against women's rights, which sounds strange and unexpected, but actually I think it's also, um, and this is maybe me comforting myself, it's also part of the inertia of the, you know, the retraditionalization and repatriarchalization that we're going through. So I think in mm -hmm. a sense, it's easier to, to deal with as a challenge because you understand all of a sudden that you are, that you have power, that, that initially maybe like hundred years ago or before women didn't because they were building it, but now you do because you have a lot of, well, you, you have a lot of allies. Um, maybe mm -hmm. we're not using them right or using them or building more coalitions and allies, but I think it's probably one of the main uh, pillars challenges for the future. Um, I think that other challenges involve maybe doing the doing not maybe doing the right thing, but doing it rightly in a sense that um, I think that pink washing is a strange phenomenon. Uh, but I think that it's, this point is doing a lot of harm and a lot of destruction to the feminine mm -hmm. movement. And I think that that we uh, we whoever that we is have to really hold ground mm -hmm. on, on that because. Um, because within the situation of backlash, on top of having pink washing, but it's really um, um, taking a lot of power, a lot of uh, hard won and hard earned power from the feminist movement. So I think those two are the, the main things. I think that the positive challenge um, uh, has to do with uh, shifts in, in philanthropy concretely, that I think that there are a lot of things that are happening and, and moving in the right direction when it comes to feminist philanthropy. I think from mm -hmm. what you said, intersectionality from a different perspective, different angles. I think that philanthropy is becoming more democratic, which works for us really well. Um, and I think that's a positive challenge that needs to be pushed in the, in the future. I think internally, because um, even though it sounds kind of technical, the way I'm presenting the challenges, they're really crushing um, activists internally as well. So there is a lot of exhaustion. There is a lot of post COVID um stress a lot of i don't know anybody who hasn't lost somebody in this crisis so 
there is a there is mourning and grief happening at the same time, but also I think a little bit a lack of enthusiasm with how to deal with internal struggles yes. with the feminist movement. And I yeah. think that the best way to deal with that is kind of to come together and think strategically, um, because I think that when you when you think about all of this emotionally and step by step, or uh, you know, if you isolate the 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 things that that are coming against you it's really hard it's really easy to get disheartened but i think that when we come together and think strategically is that when we do our best work so i think that one of the maybe internal challenges is to kind of come together and think what is what is to be done right the, the famous question so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right thank you um what would you what would you say about this galina <laughs> Yeah, uh, we did not uh, discuss the question previously, but uh, Durja said what I had in mind, so I wouldn't repeat it when it comes to uh, what's next. Uh, when it comes to other um, hurdles that I see, um, well, there are always uh, interpersonal uh, struggles or inter-organizational struggles, which are also the, the consequence of not sitting at the same table. And what I also see, uh, not as a problem, but as a need, uh, is to de-bureaucratize uh, philanthropy and uh, give groups more spaces to actually do activism rather than, you know, dying in all the paperwork. Uh, so this is something that we urgently have to solve uh, as uh, philanthropist circles. Um, that also adds up to the COVID and the griefing and uh, to other types of burnouts. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, offering more chances for uh, politics of well-being and uh, self-care and collective care. And when I say politics, I mean it really. It should be uh, supported financially as well, uh, rather than just promoting it as a nice idea. So these are these are some some of my final thoughts regarding this. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with this overall exhaustion and just lack of motivation, etc. Um, I think that uh, we're kind of learning, and it's just the, the becoming of a, a, a lifestyle, maybe to resist and to survive. And we were talking about it a lot in our group as well. And I always I have this internal resistance to this overall concept of resistance because then you're becoming uh, all the time you you have to resist all the time and it it takes out a lot of energy it's very draining in a way yes we have been probably we, we should be proud that we're uh, still you know the movement and funds we're kind of um, you know we're continue working and supporting others etc but i think this overall mode of survival mode and being resistant all the time, resilient all the time. I think it's also something that mm -hmm. uh, may be worth discussing eventually because it, it, it mm -hmm. came out as a very good idea to be resilient, you know, and just, but I, I, I personally, I have some resistance and problems with that concept. And maybe it's a topic of other conversation, of course, but I think we, um, kind of, you know, since we're talking about backlash and other things, and it's really very, very difficult in, in our context as well. And I don't know anybody that uh, that is not burned out and exhausted and just people are not even going out of their homes or, you know, everybody is seeing a psychologist or doing some mindfulness things just, just to get out of this situation. But um, And even there is this... Um, resistance to do it collectively because I think before at least we always thought that collective feminist care and collective well-being practices will help but um, mm -hmm. it seems to me that people are even not willing to go uh, you know just to meet in a smaller group that is safer group let's say that's a very um, dangerous signs warning signs that um, I'm noticing in our context but of course it's a little bit different because of all other factors, not just COVID in our case, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how is it basically in your case? I mean, is it possible to, do you think it is for now it is possible? Because I, I know that 
um, the global pandemic and also many things in global politics are changing the women's, you know, and, you know, feminist movement a lot and the way we, we are actually resisting and the different, different things. But do you think it is possible for your context to sit together, you know, with all sorts of um, feminist ID identities and actually discuss something that will be um, in in um, you know, in favor of the of, of feminist movement. What is what is what will be your take on that? Um, I don't know if it's possible, but I think it's urgent, and I think that's where mm -hmm. I think that um, I think that a lot of um, people. I'm just I'm not going to gender it. Um, don't understand the urgency of situation because I do think that we are under a backlash which only you know bears witness to the power but at the same time it is a fragile movement and so right. I don't I don't think I often say that one of the things that happen in this context which I know it's a harsh criticism but I think it needs to be it needs to happen is that feminism maybe has been too personalized I think this is one of the mistakes that we have made in this mm. context is that feminism is not the movement in access to itself, but it's understood here as a kind of a group of people uh, making the movement. And I disagree with that because it, I think that feminism is always in access to itself and that's why it cannot be defined. That's, you know, there, there's been a lot of theoretical work done so it doesn't fall on, on mm -hmm. personal. Mm -hmm. um, completely. And I think that that's one of the mistakes that we have to do to do here in this context. So I would um, personally sit and, and negotiate with the devil um, itself, but I don't think a lot of women activists or people would. And I think that we are in a position where we have to. Um, so, um, so to answer your question, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I don't think in terms of possible and possible, I think in terms of urgency, because I do right. think it's necessary right. and urgent to do so. Otherwise we will be crushed. Um, um, with yeah. a lot yeah. of people from the other Hi. side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything to add on this? Yes, I, mm -hmm. I wanted to add something that what, what Gohar right. said about being exhausted and about being um, kind of withdrawing into the private sphere. I understand that, but at the same time, again, and I'm being self-critical here a lot, um, is that I do think that one of the mistakes, at least in this context that we've made, is that we haven't built enough alliances and enough coalitions. And I think mm -hmm. there is something that feminism took over and, and probably it's a side effect when you deal with war and post-conflict societies might be inevitable, I'm not sure about that, is that you tend to create heroic narratives of survival and resilience, as you were saying. I myself think that that uh, narrative has been exhausted. And I do think that the stakes should go higher in sense of thinking what would be a feminist good life. Mm -hmm. and, and because mm -hmm. I often, and this is a personal example, I often feel guilty in this context, simply enjoying and doing nothing because there is something in that narrative of the post war yeah. of the trauma that makes right. you guilty when you do that. And I think yeah. that's wrong because I do think that uh, if there is going to be progressive politics, at some point you have to stop and say, well, is this a feminist good life? How would I know it? How would we, how would we recognize the feminist good life? Or how will we know it if we have won or changed or overcome that? And I think that's what's kind of lacking in the, in the context is that yes, mourning, yes, grief, but it could be joyful as well. And yeah, not definitely. Yeah, it, each other out. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just yeah, to talk about something like not always, you know, I, I feel really guilty for not resisting and not fighting and not having this, you know, um, exhaustion. I think it's a huge problem, really, and we all kind of lacking that. I can say personally that I have that issue as well. And I think it's really something very deep as a you know feminist and it's part of our it became part of our identity really this feeling, this guilt feeling that um, something to work with. Maybe we can think about it how you know we can collectively at least to have a space to discuss it, because I don't think we even discussing that vulnerabilities and that guilt that we have and just yeah, not being able to enjoy simple things in life even mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
and maybe maybe I can I, I'm not uh, well maybe I can say that I'm slowly <laughs> starting to practicing this <laughs> taking the guilt off <laughs> yeah the, 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 the new approach that I'm trying to to get into yes it's it's uh, it's uh, I, I totally um, agree with this um, you know attitude and also the the idea that you really need to I think the most of the times the guilt is kind of uh, is being built in uh, into into our systems when we are when we are born and we're and as uh, you know women we are even deeply feeling this guilt all the time when we're growing up and when we're doing something and as a feminist when you're being all, when you're blame when you're blamed for doing this and not doing that thing and you're not arriving and managing to do anything and everything at the same time this is also something that we I think as, as feminists, we, we also need to talk about and also take the guilt off as well. Um, I think on this uh, sort of a positive, you know, note <laughs> and with, you know, with the, with the notes of, uh, towards the, the, the better feminist future, uh, I think we can somehow wrap up and um, today's, today's conversation with Galina and Georgia. And I want to thank you once again for joining and for dedicating some time to, to us and to, to the people who are interested to uh, hear about you and about, about your amazing work and so many, so many actually activities and so many things you are doing, the amazing work that you are doing. Thank you once again for being with us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for joining. Thank Thanks you. for hosting us. And greetings to everyone who, who's watching. Yeah. Thank you. And hope to see you soon uh, live. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it was a Thank pleasure you. talking to and you. And for those who... Uh, and, yeah. And, and, uh, sorry. I, I, I guess my uh, I guess at the end of this conversation, my uh, connection is really... I don't know, cutting off maybe, yeah. <laughs> but yes, uh, thank you very much again. And we'll Well, thank you for having us. I think Sirani is having a hard time with her connection. So thank you for having us. And Thanks I'll, a lot. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, this is face to face. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm back yeah. and saying yeah. goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <Bye. Bye. laughs>